Hello everyone, today we are breaking down Season 2, Episode 3, What is Lost of The Witcher. Remember to like the video, it helps out the channel a lot, and subscribe, and yada yada yada, let's get to it. The first thing we see is Ciri training with a sword on a straw dummy, with Geralt watching her in the background. This is the beginning of Ciri's Witcher training. Geralt tells her she needs to rest Siri disagrees, she wants to continue to train. This shows that Siri is very stubborn and tends to do what she wants. She did grow up a princess after all. Geralt convinces her to rest and they head towards the Great Hall for some stew, but before that she has a vision of some woods. Something is beckoning her towards it. We find out later in the episode what that is. Geralt is concerned about her. Clearly, this isn't the first time she has had these visions. The two meet Lambert and Cohen in the mess hall. Ciri is not happy with Geralt about having to rest, and she heads to her room. Lambert then says to Geralt, Trouble with the pretty princess. Cohen says to leave it alone, and then Lambert says, Why should I? He made his choice, cost us a brother. If you remember last episode, Eskel turned into a Leshen and Geralt killed him. This shows the brotherhood the Witchers have and how Eskel's death has affected them. But the reason why I point this out is that it sounds like Lambert is blaming Ciri in a way. That the reason Geralt killed Eskel was because of Ciri. I don't know, it was a very weird way to word it. We have a flashback and we see Eskel and Geralt joking around about training and stuff. Eskel seems a lot nicer here compared to the last episode, so maybe the Leshen sting did alter his mood a bit. In the next scene, we see Vesemir dissecting the Leshen, Eskel, trying to figure out how this is possible. Leshens, at least currently known, cannot infect people with stings and turn them into Leshies. Vesemir has run a bunch of tests to see what possibly could have infected the other Leshen, giving it this new ability. Vesemir is turning over every stone. Eskel was like a son to him, so it feels like he owes it to him to do all he can. Geralt says if there was a scientific explanation, he would have found it by now. So science is ruled out, but magic is still a possibility. Geralt wants to put Eskel to rest to let him have peace. Though he did say they weren't giving up on this yet, so they do still plan on running some tests on the samples that they have taken from Eskel. We then head to Eratuza, the Brotherhood of Sorcerers is questioning Istred. The Brotherhood of Sorcerers makes the rules and regulations on the magic in the Northern Kingdoms. Istred, who you may remember as Yennefer's lover last season. If you recall, he was at a Nilfgaardian dig site before and during the attack on Sintra. Istred said there was no indication of an attack on the Northern Kingdoms by Nilfgaard. Stregobor and Artorius seem to be happy with this answer. In season 1, they dismissed the idea of an attack. So if Istred, who is a respected mage, who was around Nilfgaardians, didn't know, how could they possibly know? Vilgefort and Tesea think differently, saying we warned you that they would come for the rest of the Northern Kingdoms after they sacked Sintra. Vilgefort was the one last season who led the defense of Sawn Hill, and in a way saved the rest of the Northern Kingdoms from being attacked by Nilfgaard. Tisea says that the Nilfgaard prisoner Kahir has a magical barrier in his head so they can't extract more info on Nilfgaard's plans. Istred also makes a point to the council that he was studying monoliths while in Nilfgaard. And he believes they hold the history of the continent. He also thinks they hold the future. Clearly these will come up at some point again, otherwise they wouldn't have mentioned it. Stregobor then talks about the elves teaming up with Nilfgaard. If you remember, Francesca made a deal with Fringilla last episode. Stregobor pretty much wants to kill or put the elves that are still in the Northern Kingdoms in camps. Yennefer then interrupts the meeting. Everyone is very surprised she is still alive. Tisea and Yennefer meet in another room to talk. Tisea tells Yennefer about the meeting, how people are starting to doubt Artorius and Stregobor, and that the two are kind of grasping onto any excuse to remain in charge. Tisea thanks Yennefer for what she did at Sawn Hill during the tide of the battle, but she also tells her not to mention it, that Vilgefortz needs to carry the mantle of victory. Yennefer figures out that Tisea and Vilgefortz are making a play for Stregobor and Artorius' seats to lead the Brotherhood of Sorcerers. It is much easier to side with a war hero than someone who really didn't do much compared to what Yen did. 
In the next scene, we head to Sintra. Sintra was Ciri's home. It was sacked last season by Nilfgaard. We see Francesca and Philavandril discussing their alliance with Nilfgaard. There was a mass movement of elves heading to Sintra because of this alliance. Philavandril says the northern kingdoms have completely turned against the elves. So as I said, they will either be put in camps or killed. Francesca is looking at the brighter side of things, believing her alliance with Nilfgaard will save her people. Nilfgaard will want something in return, most likely help in the war effort, but it is a price Francesca is willing to pay. We return to Karamoran where Ciri is continuing her training. Lambert and Conan watch her as she trains. Lambert makes a snide comment saying, do you remember battling Saxa's straw? If you watched the Witcher prequel, Nightmare of the Wolf, you know the would-be witchers were basically starved and beaten for the first couple of weeks and that the training was super intense. Geralt has been much more gentle with Ciri. Ciri insists she wants to train like a witcher, so Cohen and Lambert bring her to the witcher training course. It is an obstacle course used to increase endurance, strength, and a bit of strategy is involved here as well. The first obstacle is called the Pendulum. We see this in the games as well, but slightly different. This one has a name in the books, but I cannot remember for the life of me. If you can, comment below. And this one is new and is made for the show. Siri gives it a try and immediately fails and gets smacked off. Honestly, I don't see what's so hard about the first one. It looks pretty easy to me, but whatever. Lambert asks if she still wants to be a witcher. Siri gives him a look of anger and determination. She's not going to give up that easy. In the next scene, we see Geralt and Vesemir bring Eskel's body to the cave to put the body to rest. Geralt and Vesemir are still discussing how this could be possible death by a mutated lesion. Geralt mentions how the continent seems to be evolving around them and they didn't even notice. We have heard similar statements from other characters in the show. Novella mentioned it in the first episode, how creatures who should be hibernating or hunting. Phil Evandro mentioned it last episode, how they were forced out of the caves they were staying in by monsters. So something is happening on the continent that is making creatures and things act differently. What that is, well, we should find out later in the season. Wolves show up to devour the body of Eskel. Karamorn is the school of the wolf, so this does fit in line with that. This is new to the show. It is not in the games or in the book. In the games, it's just a regular funeral pyre. We return to Eretuza with Yennefer. She is still trying to use magic, control chaos, and she is still unable to. Some of the other mages come and visit her. Sabrina, Triss Marigold, and Myrta, I believe? Honestly, she's not really important. Triss and Sabrina were both at the Battle of Sawn Hill and both survived like Yennefer. I just want to say that I like Triss's new look. I know people on Twitter complained that the showrunners caved into people complaining how she didn't have red hair, but personally, I think she looks way better this season than last. Triss and Yennefer are really good friends, and Sabrina and Yennefer are like frenemies. They're always making snide remarks about one another. They all hop into the pool for a swim except for Triss. Triss was badly scarred in the Battle of Sodden Hill in the neck chest region and doesn't want people to see. We then find ourselves with Stregobor who is giving a lesson on Falca who is a quarter elf and the rightful heir to the Redanian throne. Her father met a prettier lass and divorced her mother who was half elf and sent the two packing. Falca then led a rebellion to take back what was hers which led to the deaths of her father and her two half-brothers. The rebellion was put down and she was burned at the stake. Stregobor is painting the narrative to his students that elves are bad and crave power. Istred overhears this and corrects Stregobor saying she was only trying to take what was hers by right, which there is nothing wrong with. Stregobor reveals that he was around during the rebellion and that she took his hands. So the hands we see are just an illusion, which there should be another character we see this from later in the show. This kind of gives a reason why Stregobor hates elves so much he lost his hands to one. Then he tells Istred that if we allow Tissaia and Vilgevorts to take charge in the council, our power will be diluted with elven blood. He is referring to Yennefer, he knows she is a quarter elf. We return to Karamorn and we get a montage of Ciri failing in the first obstacle. Ciri is able to pass it finally and gives a look to the witchers. 
she moves on to the second obstacle, which legitimately is hard and gets knocked off immediately. She takes a nick in the arm from it as well, bleeding. Lambert goes up to her and says, Nice try, princess. Admit it. You belong in a castle, not our keep. I think he's trying to motivate her here. Lambert has been around her enough to know Siri is very stubborn. So if you say she can't do something, she's going to try even harder to do it. We return to Sintra and Fringilla is talking to Hawk, a Nilfgaardian general. He says that 4,000 elves are coming and more are on their way. The elves have heard the news Sintra is a safe haven for them. But Hawk brings up a good point about how do we feed all these elves. Fringilla says that the white flame, the emperor, finds a way. Then we find out that the emperor has been absent for a while. So it will be interesting to see how he will react to the defeat at Sa'an and to the new alliance with the elves. Fringilla then has a meeting with Francesca. She wants to know what this alliance is going to cost her. Fringilla tells her that the elves know the continent better than any man alive, and she wants a partnership. Francesca is willing to do this, but in exchange, she wants a home for her people. Then we find out that the elf is pregnant. If the child survives, then the deathless mother who we saw last episode would be correct in her declaration that live amongst the humans for your child to survive. We return to Eretuza. Yennefer is walking the halls. She runs into Stregobor. Stregobor puts his hand on her shoulder. Yennefer is now in her mind and is in a torture room chained up where Kahir was in episode 1. Stregobor doesn't like Yennefer to begin with being a quarter elf, but with the elves flocking to Nilfgaard's side and with Yennefer missing for a month and then miraculously returning, Stregobor believes she is a double agent, a spy. Yennefer is not answering any of his questions, so Stregobor uses a method Tissaia used on Kahir to get his answers. So Stregobor is now looking through her thoughts while inside her mind, so like Inception-ish. Tissaia is able to stop him by throwing him backwards. Tissaia tells him that he will answer for this. This could be the ammunition they need to get him off the council. We return to Karamorn and Geralt and Vesemir return from putting Eskel to rest. The two are wondering where Ciri is. Cohen finds them and brings them to the training course where all the other witchers are watching Ciri attempt to complete it. Lambert is coaching her up. Like I said, he wants to see her complete this. She passes the first obstacle easy enough. She then passes the second one, which I think is the hardest one by far. Does the parkour bit. The other witchers are cheering her on as she attempts this. She gets to the last obstacle and Geralt shows up. She notices him, and she really wants to prove she is meant for this and make him proud. She almost makes it but falls off the finishing platform. Geralt goes up to her and says, so close. Not exactly the most uplifting words, but he didn't make it, so. We return to Eretuza. Tissaia is telling the council what she saw Stregobor do to Yennefer. Stregobor gives his side of the story that Yennefer showing up after a month unscathed without having to answer any questions is ridiculous. Tissaia goes to Yennefer after the meeting. She tells Yennefer to prove she is not a Nilfgaard spy. She will have to kill the Nilfgaard prisoner, Kahir. Yennefer doesn't want to do this. She says Stregobor will just use this to vilify her. Which, to be honest, doesn't make a lot of sense. Kahir is the enemy, and the council, which Stregobor is on, wants her to do this. So this makes no sense. Tissaia says if she doesn't want to kill him, then tell them the truth. That you lost your power, and you are no threat. Yennefer then tells Tissaia, for a month, she searched the continent for something that would bring her power back to her, but to no avail. Yennefer then asks... Tissaia to help her to save her. Tissaia doesn't know how. Yennefer is a crying angry mess at this point. Yennefer wants her power back. She believes she deserves it. That she is nothing without it. But Tissaia says what is lost is lost. The power never made you happy anyways. It will not make you happy now. We return to Geralt and Ciri. Geralt is bandaging Ciri's wounds. He is not exactly happy with Ciri training on the obstacle course. He says when a witcher cracks his skull, they put him in a cot, fill him up with herbs, and he most likely will survive. 
Siri doesn't have that luxury. She has not been through the mutations. She is special, but she can still die like a normal person. So Geralt is being a real dad here. Siri wants to train harder, but Geralt wants her to take it slow. She gets frustrated and storms out. Geralt notices something in her room, tree roots. He pulls them out and finds Siri's cloak she had back from season one. The tree roots seem to be drawn to Siri in some way, and Geralt looks very concerned about this since they just dealt with a Leshen threat not so long ago. We return to Yennefer, and she is trying to sneak out of Eretuza. Istred finds her. Istred believes she could be a spy and to tell him if she is. Yennefer says she is not a spy. Istred then says he lied to the council, that he talked to Nilfgaardian followers, and they feel protected and welcomed under Emperor Amir. Also, that he plans on going to Sintra tomorrow to help with the elves migrating. Istred is a historian, and the elves are the ones who this continent belongs to. It would make sense he would flock to their side. He tells Yennefer that Stregobor has spies on the towers, so she won't be able to sneak out without alerting them, so she needs a new plan. Istred leaves, and then she has a vision of the Deathless Mother. The woman says, come to me, all you deserve and all you lost. So from this, I get that Yennefer never took a deal as the others did. She never got her wish. And the Deathless Mother is still trying to convince her to make a deal, but what cost does this deal have? That is still what I'm wondering. We return to Karamoran and Cohen is coaching Siri up. Geralt shows up and asks Siri about her visions, the feelings she get when it feels like someone is coming after her. Siri describes it as if she was being pulled towards something. Geralt then tells her that instead of turning from that feeling, follow it. She closes her eyes and leans into it and she has a vision of the woods and being pulled by something, which does happen so this is kind of a premonition. Geralt and her then walk through the woods Siri saw in her vision. Siri wants to know why this thing is after her. Geralt says he saw her mother exhibit uncontrolled magical ability that destroyed the entire throne room. That she inherited her magical abilities from her. So maybe that is what this thing is after. Siri wants to know why Geralt never said anything earlier. Geralt says he didn't want to scare her. Once again, a real dad thing to do. They come across the thing that was calling to Siri. It is the Leshen that infected Eskel. You can tell this because it is missing a hand. Leshens are very ancient creatures. They use inborn magic to control plants and animals within their territory. The Leshen starts to attack Geralt and he defends them as best he can. The Leshen is able to get a hold of Ciri and drag her towards itself. Geralt uses Igni on his sword so he can stab it through the heart. Igni is a simple magical spell, also known as a sign. It is the fire one. But before he can do it, a bigger monster kills the Leshen. This is a new monster for the show. There is no name for it, but from the way it looks, I would say it's part of the insectoid family, which basically monsters that look like bugs or have a lot of legs. Geralt tells Ciri to run, and she does. Geralt uses another sign, Quinn, while fighting this monster, which is a protective shield. The monster knocks Geralt back and could easily go in for the kill, but decides to chase Ciri instead. So another monster that is interested in Ciri, most likely because of the power she has, which she really doesn't know how to use yet. Ciri is cornered by the monster. The monster then holds out a hand to Ciri. So it seems that the monster doesn't want to hurt her. Geralt is able to jump on the monster, slicing it down the middle, and then beheads it. So this is not in the books. The only reasonable explanation I can come up with is that the monster was drawn to Ciri and Ciri to it. So the monster knows what Ciri can do even if she doesn't. So the power Ciri has, the monster wanted or wanted her to do something with it. I'm guessing this gets explained later on in the season in more detail, but for now, all I can do is speculate. We return to Yennefer, she is with the other mages, and she is walking with Kahir. She's going to behead him to prove she is not a spy. At this beheading, we see some of the other northern kings and queens. We see King Foltest, who we saw last season. He is the king of Temeria. King Vizimir, who is the king of Rundania. Queen Maeve of Lyria. King Athane of Sidrus. King Demavend of Eden. And King Henslet of Cadwin. 
I most likely mispronounced some of those. I apologize. We see a memorial in the background for the 13 mages who died at Sawn Hill. It is not said where this is, but King Foltes mentions that there is a spell up here to prevent magic from being used. Yennefer is given the axe to behead Kahir. She starts hearing the Deathless Mother again. She says to free yourself, reclaim your power, simply say the words. So either Yennefer has to ask the Deathless Mother for her power, or is like with Frangilla and Francesca's wishes, which were more like statements on how to make them come true, rather than just giving them what they want. Yennefer decides to spare the life of Kahir and the two escape. You have to remember that magic cannot be used here, none of the mages can throw a spell at her. So Yennefer has freed herself from the Brotherhood of Sorcerers, so she could be following the statement from the Deathless Mother, or I'm looking too much into it. So what do you think of episode 3? Leave it down in the comments below, and if you want more with your content, please subscribe and like the video, and check out the Twitter link in the description below, and as always, have an awesome day.